This week on Arizona Illustrated, three incredible stories about three incredible women. Slowed by Parkinson's, Sharon Kaw found a unique way to get her groove back. Wynn Bundy and her bookshop at the end of the world. For almost 60 years, Annie Laos has welcomed two Sonans into this corner store. And we look back at the women of rodeo from the vault. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. People with Parkinson's disease face debilitating symptoms such as tremors, stiff muscles, and slow, limited movement. Our next story is about a woman who found a unique way to cope with the illness and provide hope to others. I bought some bling and a Flavo Flav <laughs> clock. Sharon Ka is in her 70s, and she's only 4 feet 10 inches tall, but she enjoys performing a musical genre that might surprise you. Yo, homie, listen up. All the parkies in the room, put your hands up. All Ka is a part-time rapper on a mission with thousands of views on YouTube. What, say what? You say kick Parkinson's butt. Say what, say what? Kick Parkinson's butt. Her passionate message is about Parkinson's disease. My brain used the rhythm of rap to build detours around the failed pathways of Parkinson's. Ka was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease more than a decade ago when she was a busy professional at the University of Arizona. After working as a local radio and television reporter, she had moved on to the university. I was the director of the News Bureau really for all the 22 years I was there. But every once in a while I would get another assignment like associate vice president for institutional advancement for the University of Arizona. I needed a card that big. But her career came to a screeching halt when Parkinson's began to show its symptoms. She had to retire and step away from a familiar world. She says the disease causes the neurons in the brain to die off at a rapid rate compared to people without Parkinson's. Those neurons control movement, mood, and emotions. Everybody loses neurons. That's why Parkinson's looks so much like old age. It is old age speeded up. We have no idea what causes it. If we did, maybe we could fix it, but we don't. From the day you're told you have it, from that day forward, you can count on it getting worse and worse and worse. Ka is fighting the disease with different treatments that are showing promise. She's pounding the pavement and conquering new grounds on a daily basis by focusing on social engagement and physical activity. Exercising intensely is the one thing that shows a glimmer of hope in Parkinson's disease. That walk in the morning is as valuable to me as my medication. And it's not just walking, it's walking intensely, focusing on what I'm doing, not trying to carry on a conversation with somebody. After the initial shock and depression from her newfound circumstances, which included planning her own funeral, Ka shifted her focus from defeat to determination. I still was alive and kicking, and that's when I decided that I had to change my approach from getting ready for death to insisting on life. That's it. She's also a member of a gym for people who are living with Parkinson's. It's big steps, there you go. She enjoys this time with her newfound friends and knowledgeable trainers who push their limits. Nice man, good Michael. Michael Greenbaum was diagnosed with go, Parkinson's Sharon. in 2012. If you sort of imagine the Hulk, collapsed lung structure, folded shoulders, very stiff and rigid walk, that's very common in Parkinson's, or rigid, or tremors. And I had all of those things. Now, I think you can see that in two years' time working here at the gym. Nice, Michael, that's it. That is it right there, sir. I stand straighter and taller. I can bend my torso, and I have strength and 
can almost go back to what I was as a soldier and not got push-ups. I believe you must not sacrifice your personality to the disease. And I believe that exercise can change your brain. And I don't need a business card to tell me who I am. I know who I am. I'm the El Dopa Diva. But For Sharon Ka, the, the wrapping, the exercise, and the medicine are all part of her arsenal in the battle against Parkinson's. Rapping keeps her on her toes while requiring that she project her voice. This is vital for people with Parkinson's. Parkinson's disease is really whack, but you be illin' if you don't fight back. When I say Parkinson's, you say don't give in. Parkinson's! Don't give in! Parkinson's! Don't give in! During this event at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Tucson, Ka is accompanied by another person who has Parkinson's. Jenny Richardson finds comfort in art to deal with some of her challenges. I just think that people ought to know more about Parkinson's and know that it's getting more common. And I'd love to know why I have it. There is life after Parkinson's. Life after Parkinson's. This is a message that is dear to Ka's heart and not only because of her present condition. It is the second time her immediate family has been affected. In the 10 years that he lived after diagnosis, he went from a cane to a walker to a wheelchair. At the end, he was isolated. He couldn't go places. He couldn't make himself understood. He had no friends at all. And I felt so bad for my father, and I still do. And one day, I looked into, one day I looked into the mirror and I could see my dad's face after he had Parkinson's. She resolved it would be different for her and she's assisting others along the way. Even if you're not impacted personally, she says there may be something you can do. You need to help people be who they're able to be and that requires supporting them while they do things that are really hard. And you keep helping them and encouraging them so that they can maintain the ability to move and to speak and to have a life. And have that life before death. Thank you so much, and we really appreciate you doing what you're doing. Ain't no thing. I'm down with that word. Thank you. Visitors from all over the world travel to a remote ranch outside Benson, Arizona to find a bookshop like no other, and its energetic proprietor, Wynn Bundy. Used to be red mud road. I'm in clay. Slip, slide, it's awful. 10% grade between the gate and down here. Every morning, I go to the gate and open the gate about eight o'clock. I don't like to have customers till nine, but at eight, I open it, so it'll be open for people. People pull, as you can see, I pulled it back together a bunch of times. There. People come not to see me, they come to see the books. I'm Winifred J. Bundy, and <clears throat> I have the Singing Wind Bookshop and Ranch. My mother was Winifred, and she was Winnie. So my first husband, he's been dead for quite a while, he said, well, we got to avoid confusion here, so you're going to be Win, <laughs> which is fine. Hello, Hi. it's a group from Tucson. We are. Okay, I'm going to give you a tour here. These are all Indians of the Southwest, right in here. 
On the bottom, it's Iroquois, Cherokee, and the rest of the five civilized nations. And then you jump up, and these are the short Californians. That's the size of the book, not the people. Now the swingers, and be careful, just turn them. Don't swing them, okay? Because you might get killed by books. As a child, I either wanted to have a bookshop or an ice cream parlor. Those were the dreams that I had when I was tiny because those are the things that I really enjoyed. And so I decided the bookshop would win out. Then it's autobiography, biography, and history. I grew up all over the United States. I went to 22 schools before I got out of high school. My husband and I married when I was about, I think I just turned 19. And we had met when I was in my last year in high school. He always wanted a ranch. That's all Bob dreamed about was owning a ranch. And it had to do with his childhood. Yeah, I mean, they lost a the farm and he never got over that. I noticed an ad in the paper and we had been looking with Dan McKinney. He had been showing us places and we came to this place. He showed us this place and he said, uh, Bob, I think this is the best buy you can ever find. And we went all over, you know, we trooped the whole thing. Then he says, no, Dan, I'm not gonna buy it now. And he said, what's the matter with you? Have you lost your mind? And he said, no, but I think in about six months, I'll get it a lot less. I would watch the ads, you know, and I said one day, I said, hey, honey, there's this, that, that sounds like the same ranch. Call Dan and make an offer, make an all cash offer. And that's what we did, and we got it. Our Singing Wind Ranch, it's a little less than 640 acres, which is a mile square. We had about 150 calves, and we feed them. But it was me that was feeding them. <laughs> I went back to school, and I got two masters, a master's of library science and a master's of history. Everybody said, well, what are you gonna do? And I said, well, I'm gonna open the bookshop. And they all, ha, ha, ha. You know, ranchers and cowboys are so dumb they won't buy any books. And I said, we'll see about that. I wanted to have the bookshop on the ranch because of that. I resented their feeling that those people don't read. And I would tell them in school. I'd say, they're much more qualified in reading than you are. And they have a better background in literature and history than you do. And I meant it. We worked two years cutting the mesquite for the shelves. My husband cut it, and then I'd stain it. And the bookshop opened in 1974. I want to get the right book to the right person. Whatever subject that they're really interested in, I try to find out. When I give the tour, yeah, I try to find out what the person's interested in, and then I direct them after the tour to the books that I think perhaps they would like. All right, over here, we have uh, two shells of the creme de creme of nature writing. We get worldwide visitors, and they come from Japan, Sweden, Norway. I get lots from Norway and Sweden, they come in thick drawers. That just shows you books open so many doors and windows to people. I guess it's just everything that I ever wanted to do. I'll probably die with my boots on here. Dreams make up the substance of books. They take you to worlds, worlds that you don't know anything about and that you want to find out about and they make you dream. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share videos from this episode. You'll also find stories from future programs, an easy way to submit your own story idea, an archive of past episodes of Arizona Illustrated, 
and you'll find everything you need to stay connected with public broadcasting in Southern Arizona, azpm.org. On the corner of 17th Street and 6th Avenue, south of downtown Tucson, is a nondescript liquor store. Enter it and you'll be surrounded by the story of the Laos family, who has operated it since opening day in 1956. Welcome to Roy's. When I was 11 years, I went to work for my dad. So I was r raised in the workforce. When my husband told me he was going to open a drugstore, I thought, yippee! <laughs> That's for me. Here comes the bus. My mom is absolutely a person that I can't find anywhere else in the community. At her age, still working in retail, six out of seven days, it's amazing to me. I don't know what the next one is Can because I, I can't see it. Get your uh, magnifying glass out. I'm getting a little air. I need this thing. Oh, this is too big. I don't need this. I can see it. Today is the 10th, right? God, already is the 10th. Mm -hmm. Husband Roy graduated from the College of Pharmacy at the University of Arizona in 1952. He was a registered pharmacist and we did pharmacy for about 50 some odd years. He was kind of like the local doctor, the local pharmacist, and also got into uh, sundries and uh, beer and wine and spiritus liquor, so he had everything in one place. He used to take care of families, you know, the mothers would bring their kids in, they'd have a sore throat. Well, he knew what to do. Somebody would come in with pink eye and he knew what to do. I open at 11 o'clock, usually, or maybe a little bit before. Close at five, because I'm pretty pooped at five. <laughs> you have pricing on this uh, stuff, Mom? I didn't think when I was eight years old that I would last to nine working here at the store because I wanted to leave so badly because when my dad forced me as the oldest son to come and work here after school, I was so mad at him. Why would you do this to me? Now I'm 61 years old and I'm still here at the store. In this store, you can't sit down hardly at all and it passes fast, and I think life passes like that, fast. Um, you turn around and you're cold. We're looking at what this building was before we bought it, which was in 1956. The Shanghai Cafe, see, right there. And the prices are unbelievable. I was born and raised here, so was my husband. Tucson High, graduated from Tucson High and got kicked out of the University of Arizona. <laughs> but that's another story. I'm, I'm an old Tucson and I got sand in the blood. <laughs> I, never had, I never had the desire to move. Probably it means that I was so dumb that I couldn't move out of town. But maybe I didn't want to move out of town. Four ninety nine. Four ninety nine. Hmm. Let me add these groceries up real fast. Okay. You can come in anytime you want to and just ask for an item. And normally, when you don't see it, she'll have it somewhere else in inventory because she holds on to things like that. Where can you get these wallets again? You know, you cannot get these wallets anywhere else. These are like classic retro right here. It's just stuff that they don't make anymore, they don't sell anymore, but I keep it. Because you can't, you, there's no way in the world you could ever get it again. Volcanic oil, made for horses, but used by human beings. It used to sell like mad. You couldn't, you could keep it on the shelf. It's black and it smells like hell. <laughs> What's up, Annie? How are you? I'm good. 
Bailey's birthday yesterday. Oh, no kidding. Nine years old. Uh-uh. Isn't that crazy? Here in this store, it's not just come in and buy what you want, but it's also find out how Annie's doing. And also, she spends a lot of time socializing with her customers. So she builds relationships with them. Makes sense now. You know, like, that, oh yeah, and, that, and that's how this ties together and all that stuff. So he, we found um, a good niche in this store that you met the people and you took care of the people and we were very close so I could take care of my children. It, it all worked out very good. My brother called me and told me that my dad had passed away, so I was, I was on I-10 and I kind of got choked up a little bit. I was, didn't know what to do. I mean, I hated to see him go, but I didn't want him to live like he was living. He passed away on my birthday, August 5th. Ah, you know, things go on. Um, it's tough to lose my dad. Although he was uh, pretty tough on, on me, it goes back to this whole thing of you become your dad and your dad becomes you. And you don't realize that sometimes until later on in life. You know, so when he went, it was kind of, I kind of felt like there was a piece of me that went to Come on in, trying to catch the bus. I know what you're doing. Come on in. Just grab one. You gotta go. Never mind. You're gonna make us miss the bus. I'm not going to miss the bus. How much are these? Nine nine dollars. Um, the bus is here, Jacob. Come on. Here. Here. Okay. Here. Here. Thank you. Everybody has bus mania. They think they're going to miss the bus. It comes back every five minutes. She has uh, such tenacity, such strength, such energy. She's a constant reminder of uh, what it takes to survive in life. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. I love you. I know it. I love you too. Thank you. I like to do it. What would I do? Sit home and look at television? I don't think so. I meet people, I take care of them, they come in and talk to me, and, and it's, it keeps you, it keeps you going. See ya. The late Luis Serpa was an internationally acclaimed Hall of Fame rodeo photographer whose images capture over a half century of rodeo energy, emotion, and history. She also documented the emergence of women in this male-dominated sport in this story from the vault. Rodeos provide plenty of great photo opportunities. Many of the photographs you see in any rodeo program and publication are taken by Louise Serpa. Well, I started uh, 25 years ago. It was a little different then. I wasn't trying to prove anything. I just kind of happened into it by mistake, starting the junior rodeo and then building on up. Have you seen the role of women in the rodeo change during the 25 years? Tremendous, tremendously. I was the first one to be allowed in the arena with a card. And now, oh, there are five, six, seven, eight of us in, in the country that are doing a lot of it. Julie Bellmeyer is an 18-year-old high school student from Marana. She's been a professional rodeo rider for four years. Bellmeyer is considered a rising star in the pro rodeo circuit. Well, I hope to go a long ways after I graduate from high school. I hope to go to college and college rodeo, and hopefully I'll have the time to go down the road a little bit more than I've been able to. La Fiesta de los Vaqueros is one stop on the circuit of the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association. While women do compete, they have their own organization, the Professional Women's Rodeo Association. And of course, there is the Rodeo Queen, who is not selected because of her beauty alone. Many compete in the rodeos. That was true of Isabel Benton, who was the queen of La Fiesta de los Vaqueros in the 20s. She doesn't remember the exact year. I, I used to like to ride, but no more. My uncle used to have a big ranch, and he got some nice horses. And always the, the cowboys they like to make fun, you know. One day they have a, a very wild horse. And my uncle, you know, he come around and he said, don't get on the horse. And I pat on the horse and the horse, you know, started hee hee hee. And I get on and he start walking. He says, well, how do you do it? I said, because I pet him and kiss him. <laughs>
Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, the effect of walls on wildlife. Glass gathered in the desert becomes a source of inspiration. The Arizona family's role in shaping the American civil rights story. And the 1989 Tucson Gem Show is in full swing from the vault. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.